Greetings, and welcome to Beatles Stuffology, where two old friends sit around and talk BS, Beatles stuff, on a track-by-track -track basis, pretty much for the sake of it. My name is JG McCoy, and I'm here with my co-host, Andrew Deacon. Say hi, Andrew. Hello. Welcome. Hello. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling all right today. Uh, how are you feeling today? Uh, you know, you know, growing pains or aging pains or the growing pains involved with aging. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to try and hide the fact that, that I've got a backache by, by putting on a bellyache instead. Uh, as we discuss an absolute classic of the song that is not Ask Me Why, because I keep thinking it is. <laughs> no, I made that mistake myself. But instead, we will talk about the actual song, which is Tell Me Why. Uh, yeah, so we're, 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 you know, chugging our way through the album and we're getting on and everything is going kind of tickety-boo. It's been a pretty good album up to this point, I think it's fair to say. Uh, no absolute catastrophes, no absolute disasters. Mm -hmm. Everything is just fine. So it's time to rope off the end of the first side with this. What do you reckon? Um, well, I, I think it's probably best to um, to hear from the man himself, um, uh, John Lennon, who apparently in 1980 said, they needed another upbeat song and I just knocked it off. It was like a black New York girl group song. And that's one of the few bits of writing I've managed to find um, about this. Um, so that's quoted in, in Pete Doggett's book. Um, yeah, that, that seems about sum it up. Originally, when I was making some notes i wrote it's a bit like chains which seems to be fair um yeah it's kind of got that feel for it it seems to be written quickly the lyrics are not important although i'm sure there'll be some people who would like to hyper analyze them um and it's just a bit of um it's a bit of fun and a bit of fluff but it's certainly a bit more fun and a bit fluffier than some of the fun fluff bits that are on the first two albums. That's true, definitely. I think it's one of those songs that uh, you can tell very little effort has been put into it, um, either by the band or by everybody talking about the band. It's a massively under-discussed track, um, which on the one hand is awkward when it comes to us trying to find interesting things to say about it, but on the other hand is particularly convenient because if our mission statement for the podcast is to not just recite all the usual facts about the song and find interesting or uh, other things to say, it's kind of easy when nobody's bothered talking about this song. So we've, we've kind of got an open goal here. Okay. Over to you then. No, I've got absolutely nothing to say about it either. I realised I set myself up for that fall, even as the words were coming out of my mouth. But oh well, there we go. Um, I mean, it's yeah. fine. It's 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 been one of those songs that, in an attempt to try and find something to say about it, I've spent the morning playing it on guitar, and I think the best I can kind of find to say about it is is that there's more chord changes in it than you think there are, and I. That's kind of it. There's about seven chord changes in the first like line or two. It's it's got a it's got a kind of interesting rhythm to it. And uh, I mean, none of the chords are anything particularly special, but it kind of chunters along in its own merry little way, and it's fine. It, it is it is sort of deceptively not complex. It's not a complex song in any 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 sense of the word. Um, but there's a little bit more to it, I guess. Beyond that, it's yeah, it's it's a struggle to find um, much else to kind of uh, elucidate about the basic structure. Yeah, it's it's there. It's fine. It, it's 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 okay. Okay, so let's let's maybe sort of jump into um, um, one section that I, I think is is a new thing for Beatles songs at this point, and that's the very high falsetto in the uh, in the middle eight. Uh, and about how we feel uh, about that, because it, it really does have the, the sound of a ball squeeze going on, if I'm being perfectly <laughs> honest. Yeah. It's, Should we say it, a cartoon ball squeeze? Yeah. I mean, with John Lennon, you never know. But yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you're not, you're not wrong. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely a reach, I think it would be fair to say. Um it's funny though. I don't. I don't love the falsetto. I. I don't think it's delivered terribly well. But that the line that follows it, the um, I really can't stand. I'm so in love with you. I think is actually the best bit of the song. It should. It, it 
shifts down to an mm-hmm. E minor, excitingly, um, and it just uh, I don't know. It it's uh, that, but that is there anything I can do? Is 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 not great in my opinion. No, no, it's certainly not up there with some of the the previous um, middle eights that we've we've spoken about. But um, I suppose it's 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 just here. It's a way of getting them to the finish of the song um, in the low two minutes um, and being in a position where they can then sort of finish off with you know that that sort of signature line. You know, tell me why you cried and why you lied to me. So we we get we get to the end, and then everybody can go boom, direct that's done. But you know it's um it's not really kind of developing what's come before i think it's almost taking your mind off the fact that what comes before is pretty samey really there's there's not much there and and even in terms of the you know the way it's played there is there's there's kind of like a fun walking bass line um but that's sort of about it there's not really much that that sort of pushes it above anything else but it's you know, it's one of the cliches in terms of what we talk about, it's still better than um, a lot of their contemporaries' best work, and that probably explains why it was deemed good enough to go on side one of the album because it is in the film. Yeah, I mean, I, if I'm going to single anyone out here, it's going to be Ringo again because I do think he's doing some quite good work to try and carry the momentum of the song through. Okay. Uh, the rhythm guitars are fine. They just kind of chunk, chug away in the background. Uh, the three-part harmony is a three-part harmony. Apparently, it's a slightly different arrangement. Sounds like three-part harmony to me. Uh, yeah. But Ringo's got some good, all that, da 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 dum da 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 dum and then tell me why yeah like he's yeah he's he's got a little bit of drive going on there you're right it, it syncs well with uh mccartney's walking bass line um that helps to give a little jag of energy through the song but it's it's still you know it it's it's knocked out it's knocked out but i don't know yeah it's uh, even the even the performance which we see and it is very much just see uh in in a hard day's night is kind of it's one of the less remarkable performances in the film, shall we say. Or is it? More on that later, folks. Is it a precursor to some quite significant and amazing pieces of um, of cinema in the history of all cinematic cinema? Possibly. Question mark. Ooh, what could he be referring to? Um, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that in in a little bit. Um, Excellent foreshadowing, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I did say at the top that the lyrics are really important, but actually, I, I, without wishing to sort of close off a discussion on that, I just want to ask the question, um, is there anything that we can pick out from this? Because, I, you know, you, it's possible to look at it from, from different positions, you could have a conversation about whether it's the the woman in a position of strength, the fact that she's not supplicant to him, that he's admitting he's been a bit of a git, and that she has basically said, "Oi, you, you bit of a git, you can sod off," and he's now pleading with, "Oh, please, 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 ha- um, have me back, please," you know, um, anything, anything in there, or is this just Moni Lennon, or indeed is it just Lennon plucking out a bunch of words? That roughly fit with the song. Well, I mean, I think the I think one of the one of the interpretations is confessional Lennon. Um, I mean, there is a vague sense that this could be about mm-hmm. Cynthia. Um, I think McCartney said that at one point um, that it that it could be about him, sort of semi confessing that that you know he's been playing around or whatever, but feels guilt for it. So you know he's he's yeah he's he's putting he's prostrating himself uh, lyrically, uh, even though he's not actually coming out and admitting what's going on in in public. So. I guess you could you could put that spin on it. I think I think the weight of the lyric is probably just about enough to carry that, but not an awful lot more. Um, it I mean, Moni Lennon, yeah, definitely. That's that's definitely a part of it as well. But uh, yeah, if you wanted to give it that little sort of slightly more personal spin, I think yeah, I think the lyric can just about take that weight. Yeah, I'm I'm not really in the realm of doing uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, partly because. You know, I'm not really very good at it, but also because I don't actually think there's, um, you know, as much in it. I seem to remember someone saying, well, how many people did Freud actually cure? Hmm, there's your answer. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think it, you're right. That professionalism is, is the important thing there, isn't it? It's like putting together a feel for a song that is going to appeal, that, that fits um chucking in the important words and and you know if people want to see that as maybe 
um, them demonstrating their sensitivity and vulnerability, then that's fine. If if that's true and, and that appeals to a lot of people, that's great. But um, I don't know whether or not we would have gone down quite in, in that depth in terms of Beatle lyrics in those early days. And and I think they certainly underplay it as well, don't they? It's only really yeah. when they start talking about songs that have a connection to Dylan, man, that, that then they, they seem to be taking their own uh, lyrics a little bit more seriously. So no, I, I, think I think that's I think that's fair, and I I think also that thing about it being like uh, what was it? What was Lennon's expression? A black New York girl group? Um, yeah, you know, like yeah. like a lot of those kind of lyrics are are kind of oh, I don't want to call this song derivative. That's probably too strong, but it's it's kind of replicating that sort of that feel, that kind of oh, you know, it, it was all my fault. I sorry, yeah. yeah, please have me back kind of material. Which is fine. I mean, you know, but that that sense that the lyric is probably more about generating that feel is 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 I would say at least fifty percent as relevant as as anything he's putting into it, either confessionally or, you know, well, anything else really. Yeah. I mean there's 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 no narrative and and relative inconsistency in terms of what's there to the point where it's it just seems like it is a bunch of words that were put down on paper you know um but i'm sure as, as we go through this this exercise we will start to pick up a little bit more on uh lyrical subtleties um and do you know what we've made reference already to to the film i think one of the most interesting things about this bearing in mind we've said this is potentially moni lennon is how much he seems to be enjoying himself singing it in the film so you sort of figure if there was any kind of depth of emotion behind it he would be acting that depth of emotion but he's not he's having a great time and, and i think he's just enjoying himself singing it and he's probably not thinking about the words other than remembering what the next word is um and, and i think that's 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 where we get to with this it's um it's not filler because it's a lot better than than filler um but it's should we say effective yeah and, and not not sort of long lasting as well because it's another one of those that's just never played live it's sort of knocked up in the studio um i don't know whether it's four six seven eight uh takes i missed five out there don't know why um and um and then that's it it's done so um interesting in that respect but um yeah effective and move on yeah so that should make for a short episode um <laughs> however <laughs> however I've, I've got i've got a biggie i've, I've got a biggie for you um, all right and, go on. And, and, Give and me a biggie. I, th I think you'll like this um okay so doing a little bit more kind of digging into um into the film and of course I, I i realized that in previous episodes i've fallen into the trap of assuming that the director is i wouldn't say the auteur but the, the person who's responsible for everything well of course actually there's an awful lot more people involved in putting together um, the look and the feel of a film um one of the most important people in that would be the director of photography or cinematographer um i don't know if the name gilbert taylor rings any bells with you um, um yeah yeah, I can recognize it, 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 but I can't. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, yeah. I'm getting to that because he was the cinematographer on such things as The Omen. Okay, well, that's, that's one. That's fine. Um, he did also work with um, Richard Lester on It's Trad Dad. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm going to go into It's Trad Dad in, in lots of depth when we, suddenly, when we start talking about the film of A Hard Day's Night. In the same year as A Hard Day's Night, he was responsible for the cinematography on uh, Dr. Strangelove. However, well, yeah. you may know his name from the credits of a, of a little film that came out in the mid to late 1970s called the Star Wars. Uh, it doesn't ring a bell, but okay, sounds interesting, mm. sounds interesting. He was, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So on what's now commonly referred to as episode four, but everybody else of a certain age refers to it as Star Wars, he was the, um, um, the cinematographer, which I think is, is quite interesting. In particular... Um, when thinking of of you know a few scenes in particular um, where you've got the use of light and it's the use of light that that um i think it's worth drawing a comparison to so you remember there's there's a shot in um on, on the death star where you've got the um millennium falcon you've got lots of sort of you know um empire troops and you know darth vader's around and stormtroopers coming and going 
there's not a lot of of light on there other than the light that's built into the set so there are lights in and around the background you you, you can probably if you sort of imagine yeah. now on, on the desktop picture the, the sort of the, the almost the white fluorescent tubes that are built into the walls for example and and if you know looking at um um the american cinematographer um uh, association magazine talking about dr strange love um it, it talks about the fact there was um graphic high contrast illumination from taylor and he says that strange love was at the time a unique experience as the lighting was to be incorporated in the sets with little or no other light used so that's what he told um american cinematographer in 2006 so just then sort of draw the comparison to the filming of um tell me why there's a lot of use of studio lights in there you're in a dark theater but it seems to be lit not through um you know kind of like the off camera lighting but through the use of the the theater lights of the the, the lights that are hanging over um, the beatles as they're playing and that sort of illuminated white set and and i put it to you Milud, that actually what we're seeing is the development of ideas um that end up appearing in in star wars you know what, about 13 years later and, and in fact if you think about um dr strangelove one of the most famous shots in dr strangelove is um of the president with all his advisors in their you know sort of big hq underground bunker whatever the lighting the in there room. comes from almost like a halo the war room thank you a halo oh yeah that's it there's no was it no <laughs> violence in the war room yeah. or something like that um like a, a halo light that's hanging over where yeah. they're sitting and sort of thinking that well actually do you know what there's something similar going on in hard day's night to dr strangelove in the same year and i think it's fascinating that that you've got a cinematographer who's who's doing that and of um of hard day's night he said the film's tv studio set performance um i'll read that more properly the film's tv studio set performance sequences filmed at twickenham studios gave taylor a chance to capitalize on his penchant for high contrast black and white in part to make up for the shabby stages he was forced to use the white backings there were terrible, he recalled. They were just filthy. So the only solution was to just fill them with light to kill the dirt and then overexpose the hot areas uh, by several stops. And so it's interesting, you know, he talks about using intense light to explode the images and make things as exciting as they could be. And some of that is through using the, the various spots, uh, spotlights um, that, that seem to be occurring. So it's worth going back and, and and having a look because the one interesting shot that there is, well, in fact, there's, there's two other things that are particularly interesting, um, but I'll do the one that sort of relates to this first. Um, the, the one inter really interesting shot is a tracking shot from behind the band. And it goes, you know, you can see, you know, the back of Lennon and then it goes behind Ringo and just sort of slightly keeps going. And you can sort of make out the, the screaming fans, but also you've got, you're almost looking directly into the lights that are on the balcony uh, pointing towards the stage. So you get that kind of flood of light in the background and, and sort of looking, not quite from their point of view, out towards the audience, but almost as though you're trying to get that sense of feeling like you are on the stage with them. And then to just finish on that, the, the only other thing of, of particular interest um, in relation to the way it's shot is that it takes about 20 seconds of the song bearing in mind it's only like a two minute 10 song and they, they actually cut the end off because it's a bit of a medley here and um, the first 20 21 seconds you don't see the band a lot of that is shot looking at the audience and the excitement of the audience admittedly there's also the backdrops where you've got the kind of you know the Beatles in motion but um you know those those are sort of you know, a series of, of of stills that have been put together as a display but a lot of that, that opening section is looking at the excitement of the fans and almost effectively saying well here you go this here's a bunch of people who are really really excited you should be excited too um which i think is a, is a different way of doing it it's just that 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 sort of sense of um of of the excitement of the song even before you then see the people who are singing the song 
so there you go there's there's some some in-depth film analysis um that certainly bolstered the episode by about five minutes excellent good um i mean that <laughs> that's uh, i'm very happy we've now passed the 20 minute mark um yeah i mean that's all that is all very interesting i think it's um also curious because i don't like i agree with what you're saying but i actually don't think that this is a particularly well directed segment um i think the direction is quite clumsy in places and uh that tracking shot is interesting because i think it's the uh i think it's the the most striking moment of that performance but a lot of the a lot of the shots of the actual band playing are making the same kind of almost visually grammatical errors that we've talked about before so you know like whoever it is say john lennon steps forward to, to sort of start singing the the vocal and it will cut to mccartney or you know um oh here's the solo so the guitar solo so let's look at ringo there's a lot of that kind of clunkiness about it and um although we've had a couple of segments in the movie prior to this which have have been guilty of that i think it's one of the things that distinguishes a hard day's night is that there's much less of that when you compare it to say things like a performance on the BBC or a performance on Ed Sullivan or whatever it is, um, the, the movie is better at that. And that's logical because there's more time to edit, to control what's going on and, and, and sort of make sure that the right person is actually in frame. I think Tell Me Why slightly suffers. And that's why I sort of said at the top of the episode but that it's, it's not the most remarkable section of the movie, precisely because it's falling back into those traps of um, he, John singing. So here's a shot of George looking slightly grumpy on stage. And and I feel that that's a shame because I, I do agree with everything you're saying about the, the lighting and the cinematography, but the direction in this case is just not doing it any favours at all. I'm, I'm certainly not disagreeing with you uh, on any of that, just sort of trying to effectively um pick out some things that are um particularly useful and interesting to um to sort of say that even in amongst the the averageness of this as a sequence compared to some of the brilliant sequences that, that we've already had in the film i think there's still some some gems um to pick up on and, and something that that's worth a second look i oh, think absolutely. um absolutely so, and it, it, yeah, it's an excuse to go back and have a look at various bits of, of Star Wars as well, because actually I'd never really appreciated um, elements of the cinematography uh, in Star Wars. I never sort of watched it from from that point of view before. So um, so that that was particularly interesting. And, and there's quite a lot of depth to some of those shots in places where you wouldn't expect to see it. And then once you start seeing the light that's built into the set, it's just suddenly absolutely everywhere yeah um mind you i mean he was also um um gilbert taylor also the the dp on uh the dam busters which makes an awful lot of sense yeah uh, bearing in mind this <laughs> yeah yeah so um yeah um, really really interesting guy and, and apparently he, he didn't I don't know if it was that he didn't get on with George Lucas. I don't know if he would have been um, asked to come back for Empire Strikes Back, but certainly he was a bit frustrated uh, having to wait so long for for him to make decisions that um, you know he certainly then didn't want to be involved um, in Empire Strikes Back. So um, yeah, but but um, an interesting character. Um, and I've forgotten how much I, I like looking at uh, things like cinematography. Um, there have been some some quite amazing ones in their time, but the more I sort of look at, at um, Gilbert Taylor's work, the the more I think there's something pretty striking and um, and unique about what he does. Absolutely, this this has been your Gilbert Taylor tribute uh, episode, and, yeah. and we would like to dedicate this episode to his work. But also, I mean, I I mean, you're right, but it's also going to be really interesting to go back and watch the entirety of a Hard Day's Night with that in mind. Obviously, we have our we have our Hard Day's Night episode coming up, and we do want to remind everyone that that's happening. Uh, but yeah, it'll be it'll be really <laughs> interesting to go back and and to take that into account when when sort of uh, reviewing the the movie in its entirety. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm now just reminding myself of, of some of the other films that he did, which I should stop doing because it will hold <laughs> it's not up. Technically, about it's tell me why is it? <laughs> well, no, but then isn't that kind of the point? Oh, yeah, that no, was, absolutely. Uh, apart from Ice Cold in Alex, the other one that I forgot was uh, was one I'm pretty sure you'll be a fan of, uh, Flash Gordon. Well, you um, know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, when's your Queen podcast starting up? Uh, <laughs> sometime never. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. But there you go. I mean, it's it, it's fine. It's it, sometimes you have to kind of scoot around the subject. I you mean, you are not wrong. Um, and and I think it's we're gonna find that there are lots more interesting things come up about songs like this as we go on because um, there are more interesting people who are finding themselves attached to the band, and that's that's what's happened here. Um, you know, the fact that that Richard Lester was involved and Richard Lester had worked with Gilbert Taylor is significant. And the fact that Richard Lester had worked with, you know, disparate elements of the goons before, of course, is significant. And the fact that, the, you know, the goons had worked with George Martin before and you sort of, you know, all of these connections really help embed the Beatles in, um, in that sort of 60s culture, but also helps elevate them above some of the, the other acts that were around at the time um and you know i've at some point i might watch the dave clark five movie um get back to me on that one but mm, yeah yeah i would i mean i did mention earlier i i can't remember if i've i've discussed it with you yet the um um it's trad dad um it's certainly something that i've i've highlighted in in stuffology.co.uk which i've recently started up just as an excuse for me to get my backside in gear and do some of my own writing um because it, it it's very much the precursor to this but it's also basically a direct follow-on from um a very similar film in america with some of the same people involved screenwriter i think actually even richard lester funnily enough but um and and the producer uh, but it is very much of the let's put the show on here tradition of of movies. But there's a real link to some of that goonish humour. And there's real interaction with the, um, you know, you might call it postmodernism now, wall breaking, fourth wall breaking stuff. Um, there's some very clever stuff that turns up in there that I think is ahead of its time. Um, and another Beatles link, um, of course, the, the narrator in It's Trad Dad was uh, uh, Derek Geiler, who, of course, appears in A Hard Day's Night. Anyway, there's there's all of that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, it, it's worth having a look at because it contains a whole load of of jazz and and pop singers. Um, and nominally, the star is, oh, here's another Beatles connection, Helen Shapiro. And, yeah, that surprised me, too. And I've watched the whole thing. <laughs> It's a pretty terrible film, but you can sort of see why the people that made that then went on to make A Hard Day's Night and thought, well, actually, the raw material here is different. We need to do something different with it. Um, so, um, yeah. So when we say tell me why, that's fine. You know, I, I, I keep hearing Ask Me Why in my head. Um, and are there are there two other Beatles songs that contain... 66 percent of the the same words in the title i don't know um i don't i'm just trying to sort of desperately get us to the half hour mark here um, you know it, it, it'll be fine <laughs> i think i think we'll manage it i'd also like to point out that a film can ab be absolutely terrible and still be a really fascinating cultural artifact those two things are in no way separate from each other in that fact, is true um, it's trad, it, it, it's trad dad is available in its entirety on youtube um, because you won't find it on any of the streaming services. <laughs> That's very um, surprising. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but worth a look, and and I will at some point be be looking at um, the musical sequences and and some of the, the what we might now call postmodern elements of of the the storytelling in there um, that that are a lot of fun. Uh, for for a bad film, it's a lot of fun uh, in a way that an awful lot of good films sometimes really really aren't. Fair enough. Right, let's wrap this up. We're basically at the half hour mark now, so I think that's fair. Um, score? Me? Um, oh, I don't know. This is a. Um, if I was giving half marks, I, I, I there would be a definite five. Um, so you know, as with all of these things, I, I tend to compare it to um, um, other ones I've done. So um, I'm now stalling while I bring up the spreadsheet. Um, oh, I don't know. Is it a five or is it a six? I don't know. Um, does it make a difference? It's probably a six because I mean it's it's not bad, um, but yeah, I don't know. At some point, I'm going to work out that perhaps there isn't as much of a of a gap between my sixes and my eights as you might think, and I'm just going to have a whole load of sixes 
And what I should start doing is is being more Twitter and being deliberately controversial. Um, but maybe I'll save that for um, for one of the biggies. Maybe I'll give Strawberry Fields two out of ten, just to see what kind of non-reaction reaction I can uh, engender from people. So the basic gist, yeah, let's give it six. It's all right. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm going to give it a five point five. Um, it's 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 perfectly cromulent, but okay. I don't think it's probably any more than that. Uh, and. Um, I will look forward to trying to find a new host for this podcast after you give Strawberry Fields Forever 2 out of 10. That was fair enough. I, I, you know, it, but this is what we have to be, isn't it? Um, you know, we have to sort of give emotional responses to, uh, um, um, you know, how we feel. Because let's face it, we're not professional music critics. Um, we're just sort Yet. of amateurish bums who are making it up as they go along. So, you know, six gives it, in my mind, um, a similar feel to If I Fell, um, Happy Just to Dance. I mean, it, it, it's very similar to Happy Just to Dance with You, isn't it? It's it's that kind of thing, um, except sung slightly better. George, looking in your direction. Um, <laughs> yeah, and actually looking down this, I think that the harshest I've been is to Don't Bother Me and a taste of honey mm, right no I'm, I'm revising let's go five let's go, go five. five yeah okay yeah Life take updates, that everyone. <laughs> take that yeah good yeah. well and i hope you'll appreciate the sheer quality of this segue <laughs> if you do want to disagree with any of our rankings or indeed have any other comments about the podcast you can contact us on twitter at Beatles underscore ology. Uh, we are also Beatles Stuffology at gmail.com. And you can find my blog at www.jgmacquarie.scot. And you can now read some of Andrew's writing at www.stuffology.co.uk. Um, also, check out my other podcast, which is Talking Trek to You, where a noob and an expert go through the original Star Trek series episode by episode. Please like, rate, and review us on whatever podcatcher you're using uh, so that more people can find the show. Next episode, we will be compensating for the shortness of this episode as we tackle one of the big totemics. So, we will be doing Can't Buy Me Love. But until then, keep listening.